For Kramer Media in Johannesburg, I'm Sane Jamini, South African clinical psychologist Wabi Long joins me to discuss his book titled Nation on the Couch, Inside South Africa's Mind. So the decision to write the book came to you at a 2019 conference. Can you briefly tell us about that? I was asked, uh, Sane, to give a talk on the psychodynamics of, of violence, the, the psychological factors that come to bear on the problem of violence. And, and so I gave this keynote at the 2019 meeting uh, of the South African Psychoanalytical Association. And it was during the question and answer session after that keynote that the idea of the book came to me. One of the, the analysts in the audience, Mark Solms, was speaking about the contribution that psychoanalytic therapists can make um, to, to civil society in South Africa by, by writing about South Africa's social problems from a psychoanalytical perspective. And that's, that's really when I realized that I had the book because the keynote was, was precisely about that. The keynote was, was about violence in, in its different forms, be it interpersonal violence, be it uh, structural violence um, or just the violence of, of racism. And that's, that's the moment that it dawned on me that uh, I had a book to write. And uh, it goes without saying, Mr. Long, that uh, our country has diverse kinds of people, hence we are called the Rainbow Nation. Did you have that in mind while you were writing this book? Absolutely. I, I wouldn't say I had the, the Rainbow Nation in mind because the, the Rainbow Nation is a very optimistic uh, image of, of, of the nation. Um, what, I, what I had in mind rather was an image of quite a fractured nation, a divided nation. And that fact, I think, uh, shows itself in the structure of the book where the different chapters, I would say, speak to different groups in South Africa, be it the poor and working classes, be it the rising black middle class, or be it white people. The chapters in the book affirm the fact that ours is a, is a fractured nation. But in the same breath, I also argue in, in the opening chapter, in the introduction actually, that there is something that, that does unite South Africans. And paradoxically, what unites us is our alienation. What, what unites us is our estrangement, our estrangement from ourselves, from each other, from our leaders, from our institutions, um, from our places of work. It's, it's alienation that defines the South African nation. And is there anything wrong about us as South Africans? Um, we seem to be stuck in a loop. Yes, we, we are very much stuck in a loop. When one reads the, the newspaper um, heading, headlines every morning, it's, it's as though we are reading the same stuff over and over again, whether it's about interpersonal violence, gender-based violence, uh, corruption, racism, uh, service delivery protests. It's the same stuff over and over again. So most definitely we are stuck in a loop. That's where I think the potential value of this book lies in that I think it can help us understand why it is that we're, we're stuck in this, in this loop. You know, many, many books about South African life are purely descriptive. All they do is they, 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 they tell you what the loop is but they don't necessarily explain why the loop is there. And this book attempts to, to dive into the, the depths of the, the national psyche, as it were, to try and understand how we got ourselves caught in all of these uh, dysfunctional and, and destructive loops. You also say that there is a disconnect between the social and psychological. Would you briefly unpack that for us? Yes. So there's a, there's a long-standing problem within psychology about how to bridge the gap between the social level of analysis and the psychological 
level of analysis. And historically with, within the academy, this has played out in terms of tensions between different disciplines, whether it be sociology on, on one hand, on the one hand, and, and psychology on the other hand. Sociologists often, not always, but, but often do not necessarily see the value of psychology for understanding social problems because the problems are understood as being social rather than psychological in nature. And psychologists for their part tend to be socialized in a particular kind of way where everything is about um, one's childhood, uh, one's parents, family relations and all of that um, with little consideration given to the, the wider world and how the state of a given society can impact on a, a particular person's individual psychology. So you can hear from the, the, the picture that I'm painting here that there is a long standing divide between the social on the one hand and the psychological on the other. Another way to frame it would be to also talk about the divide between the material on the one hand and the psychological on the other. Um, and I think this has a long history in, in Western philosophy in particular. When one thinks of what Rene Descartes said several hundred years ago, I think, therefore I am, what he, what he ended up doing was splitting the mental or the psychological from the material. The, he ended up splitting our internal worlds from the external world, worlds that, world that surrounds us. And by saying, I think, therefore I am, he, he was also saying that the mind is superior to matter, to the material world. Um, and, and what I try to do in the book is to say that the distinction that we often draw between the psychological and the social, or the mental and the material, that's a false distinction, that, that the two actually go together. We, we can't talk about the material world without talking about psychology just as we can't talk about psychology without talking about the material world. So the book is an attempt to sort of, I think, overcome quite an unhelpful divide that has a long history with, within the Western Academy. Now, talk to us about something that you mentioned um, in your book, Yielding. Would you briefly unpack that concept for our readers? Sure. So this, this comes up very much towards, towards the end of the book. I think part of the problem with, with, with South Africa is that people are incredibly defensive, incredibly defended, and it makes conversations with each other very, very difficult, particularly across racial lines. You know, when one thinks about racism, it is, it's often a problem of projection where we have particular racist ideas about the other person, and then we, we project those those racist ideas onto that person, and then we act as if that person has those, those characteristics, even though it's our own stuff. And, and what we need to do actually is to introspect and to take back those projections, because it's only when we own our own projections, when we, when we admit what, what is our stuff, rather than just always projecting onto the other person, that we can start having real conversations with each other. And the idea of yielding for me is, is really about moving beyond this aggressive self-assertion where we're always pointing the finger at the other person, where we're always making the problem the other person. The idea of yielding for me is, is all about recognizing one's own internal state and acting respectfully, um, acting mindfully of other people or towards other people. So the concept of yielding, it, it's, got a, it's got a long history in, in Eastern philosophy. Um, and it's, it's really all about holding back, being reflective, being humble, respecting the other person rather than making assumptions about about the other person or projecting the stuff that we don't want to 
face up to about ourselves onto other people. DASA, our country, now South Africa, need a truth and reconciliation commission. What would you say? That is a very big question, Sane. I would say that the general impression among the South African public is that the first TRC um, did not really achieve its goals. There were certainly some South Africans, perhaps, who um, found it to be a healing and a restorative experience. But I think for many South Africans, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of issues remained unresolved. Whether it was perpetrators not taking responsibility um, or not uh, being truthful um, in their disclosures, for many South Africans, the TRC did not achieve its goal. I would say that a second TRC is, is, is very important for the future of this country. But I don't necessarily mean by a second TRC that we need to have it in a kind of institutional form where you've got a, like a presiding officer and a, and a board, you know, in the way that it was done with, with, um, with Desmond Tutu the first time around. I'm, I'm not suggesting that. What I mean by by the value of another TRC is the value of open and honest conversations with each other. Because there is so much unresolved trauma in our history, it's exceptionally difficult for us to have authentic um, and honest conversations with each other. So the idea of a, of a TRC for me a follow-up TRC is about open and honest engagement with each other. And of course, Sane, that, I mean, that's easier said than done, right? Um, because, because our country is, is so divided in, in all sorts of ways, I think the first impulse for many people is just to run for the hills, to run for the hills and to retreat and to pull back and to batten down the hatches and to not talk, to not have conversations across divides, whether those are racial divides or class divides uh, or cultural divides um, and so on. But there is, well, for me anyway, there, there, there's little doubt that there is, there is so much that as a nation we still have to talk about. The TRC from, from the late 90s and, and, and the early noughties was an important intervention, don't get me wrong, but I, I think that many if not most south africans would would agree that the business with which the trc was concerned back then is still unfinished and it, it was also interesting to read that you have had the assumption that the future of south africa depends entirely on the poor and the working class tell us about that yeah so i've i've tended to take the view that the future of south africa as you put it, depends on the, the fate of the poor and working classes. And that's a very commonsensical assumption to make. The, the trouble, I think, is, and, and this is a, a conclusion that has been drawn on at both ends of the political spectrum, it's that the, the poor and working classes um, struggle to organize themselves into a viable political force. Um, and, and in fact, what the historical record seems to suggest is that it's actually the, the sort of lower strata of the middle classes that, that can really organize a revolution. And when I, when I talk about the, the, the lower strata of the middle classes, what I, what I mean is people who are trying to break into the middle class but who find themselves frustrated, who find the, 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 the doors barred or locked. Um, it's when those frustrations at the lower end of the middle class get galvanized that you have a revolution on the cards. So the, the argument I make in the book actually is that, sure, everybody, everybody wonders why South Africa hasn't descended into civil war, given the massive levels of inequality. The answer is quite simple, that the most disenfranchised South Africans do not have the, the wherewithal to organize politically into, into, a, into a serious force. But the, the lower end of the middle classes, the frustrated end of the middle classes, 
they can certainly bring about real political change. You also talk um, of compelling historical, professional, and moral reasons why psychologists cannot sit on the sidelines when it comes to the question of violence and whatever kind. Would you kindly elaborate on that? Sure. So mainstream psychology, unfortunately, has a very bad reputation. Mm -hmm. When one looks at the, the history of, of psychology, there are far too many instances of collusion and collaboration with oppressive political regimes. And one of the truisms, I would say, of mainstream psychology is that it tends to follow power. Psychologists are an incredibly entrepreneurial breed, and I realize I'm talking about myself as well. They, they can sniff opportunities when those opportunities present themselves. And historically, that's what psychologists have done. They have been highly effective at insinuating themselves into the corridors of power. They've been incredibly effective at forming alliances with social and political and, and bureaucratic elites. And what that has meant is that many times psychology has found itself on the wrong side of history. Part of the problem also is that psychologists tend to try and keep politics out of the consulting room. There is this image of the psychologist as this blank screen, this completely neutral figure onto whom the patient can then project all their psychic material. And, and I would say that that is a complete myth. The idea that the, the psychologist is a neutral figure is highly ideological. And it boils down to the, the claim that, that someone who is not political is really not political. There's no such thing. There is a politics behind no politics. And, and that's really about, you know, the fact that when, when, when you attempt to claim that you don't have a position, you're still taking a position by, by claiming that. I argue in the book that the time has come. The time has come for psychologists to, to recognize the history, the history of sidling up to power. And in the South African instance, it means making ourselves more open to having political conversations with our patients. Too often, politics is, is kept at the door. Um, and I don't think that that, that is um, the way of the profession. Um, how, how is it possible in a country like South Africa, where politics is everything, that you can have a person, you can have a, a, a therapeutic conversation with a patient and not talk politics? It just doesn't make any sense. The personal is political, to, to use the famous feminist slogan, and the political is personal. Um, and and for, for that reason alone, politics has to find its way into our consulting rooms. There have been, um, there have been communities of psychologists that have welcomed politics into the consulting room, but by and large, that has not been the preference of the profession. And lastly, do you have an optimistic you for our country now? I would say, Sane, that I have, a, I have a tempered optimistic view for South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't believe that we can psychologize or therapize ourselves um, towards a golden future. Um, in the book, I argue that we simply have to deal with the material inequalities on the ground. We, we, can't, we can't imagine that we can just treat each other respectfully and with dignity in a purely psychological kind of way, whilst we continue to condemn millions of South Africans to, to lives of ignominy and indignity, unless and until we, we are able to deal effectively with the problem of inequality, then hope will remain a pipe dream. Um, I do also point out in the book that the question of how to end inequality is a very difficult one indeed. Um, there are no straightforward answers on, on that question. It, it really boils down to 
who it is that you're speaking to and what kind of economics is, is being punted. But the fact remains that until we deal with material inequality effectively in this country, we can't expect a, a hopeful future. But what, what a psychological outlook can do is remind us of the importance of recognizing the humanity in each other, recognizing the importance of respect and dignity. And in that, in that I suppose, small way, that's the contribution of, of psychology. Um, the, the larger question of dealing with material inequality, that is the burden, I would say, of, of our economists and our political scientists and, and, and so on. That was Wabi Long in conversation with Polity about his book titled Nation on the Couch, Inside South Africa's Mind.